Sarah Murdoch currently serves as a regional science advisor for the U.S. Geological Survey's northern eastern region. He has spent most of his career as a research hydrologist with the Watershed Research Group of the U.S. Geological Survey in Troy, New York. For, from 1982 to 2006, he led research projects on watershed biogeochemical bio processes and the effect of the acid rain and climate change on aquatic systems. In the mid-1990s, he served as a Department of Interior representatives to the White House Committee on Environmental and Natural Resources, where he co-authored the Framework for Environmental Monitoring and Research, a plan for integrating the, nation, the nation's monitoring programs to solve our more complex environmental issues. In 1999, he was awarded the DOI Merit and Service Award for his contributions to the to science of the biochemistry and his volunteer efforts in the environmental education of the public. Peter Murdoch. Well, thanks, Meg, for that introduction. Um, I heard about the landmark lecture series uh, from Jeff a few years ago for the first time, and it's an honor to be asked to, uh, to speak in it. Um, my talk has a somewhat cryptic title, so I thought right at the beginning I should um, explain to you uh, why that's there. Um, Thoreau was one of our first observers, deep observers, of the uh, natural landscape. And um, he actually saw himself as an integral part of that landscape. As this quote you know, suggests, shall I not have intelligence with the earth? Am I not partly leaves and vegetable mold myself? And so he understood in a visceral way uh, the idea of an environment being a whole system of integrated parts and that we are part of that whole system. And uh, this is a mindset that we have strayed from since Thoreau's time. Um, there's a great uh, challenge now in science to bring us back to that from the uh, narrow, uh, specific research that we've done the last hundred years on uh, minute aspects of one sector of one scientific discipline uh, to thinking about how those component parts actually work together and how we are a part of how those function. So uh, tonight I'm going to spend some time uh, trying to draw you into the efforts that we have uh, been undertaking to try to, to do that. Um, that's, uh, the button is down here. I also um, noted that I'm following uh, a talk that was given by Bill McKibben um, in the fall, and so I'm both honored and a bit intimidated by uh, <laughs> following such an uh, important uh, figure. Um, I listened to uh, Bill's talk, and I will re actually reflect back on it a bit tonight because it, it, it helps in making some points I'm trying to make. Um, he, uh, he referred to himself um, during that talk. Uh, he, said, he said, I always feel like I'm the guy who's here to bum people out. Um, and uh, I, thought, uh, I thought, well, geez, I'm a scientist, so I'm the guy providing him with the data that he's using to bum everybody out with. Um, and uh, but that's uh, that is the role you know that we're that we're playing here tonight. Um, Bill is a uh, uh, is like the prosecutor in a trial. He's the advocate. He's the person making the case. But uh, in any courtroom, they also need the information. They need the data. They need they need the evidence that allows them to make that case. And the evidence can't be developed by someone who's also the primary advocate, because otherwise it seems like that, that uh, data is tainted, that evidence is tainted. And so um, I'm here uh, on a slightly, in a slightly different role than the, than the one that Bill has. Um, 
We're talk, we're, I work for an organization that provides the information that is used for the debate on climate change. And um, it is what I would argue, uh, using legal terms, uh, probably the largest and most complex forensics exercise in human history. Because we are trying to figure out how all the complex processes that are controlling the earth and how it works interact in an environment where the climate is changing. Um, my, uh, my daughter, who's there in the picture, actually worked for Bill McKibben uh, for, for four years uh, when she was a student and um, then went on to work on social justice issues and writing uh, related to the uh, changes that are occurring in the Bakken oil fields. Um, and uh, so it, she, uh, she also was part of that advocacy world. Um, and uh, the two go hand in hand. Uh, they, uh, they are both important. Um, we really can't deal with the climate crisis without dealing with both of them. So I work for the U.S. Geological Survey. Our job is to provide non-biased information for the public, for avoiding hazards, and for solving problems on the environment. <clears throat> um, we have no regulatory authority. We are actually the only federal agency that doesn't tell anyone what to do. We only have the role of providing the information that helps make those decisions. And that's an interesting uh, situation. I, I spent some time in my career working on forest issues uh, related um, to acid rain in the, the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks has a rule called forever wild for a big portion of its landscape. Um, we learned some things about, um, about the effects of acid rain that suggested that uh, the landscape was actually not wild at this point. It was seriously damaged and needed to be nursed back to health before it could actually regenerate as a healthy long-term uh, forest. And so um, I suggested that forever, forever Wild had to allow, allow some cutting, um, which, of course, uh, didn't make me seem like an environmentalist to uh, some of my colleagues in, in uh, the organizations that would, uh, would not approve of that. Um, at the same time, uh, we have not been immune in the USGS from the climate denier crowd. Um, matter of fact, uh, we'd like to thank them for uh, making nerds like us feel like we are a part of some deep conspiracy to uh, <laughs> to fake out the world, it makes our jobs that much more intriguing. Um, but the reality is that we are uh, the scientists who collect the background information that other people use in the debate. So let's start, uh, figure this is a science, build as a science talk, and I am a scientist. I'm actually not a climate scientist. I work on what they call climate effects, the ecosystem changes that occur as a result of changes in climate as things get wetter or drier, as they get warmer or cooler. And, uh, but um, I thought uh, that um, for uh, the students in the room and the people who aren't as familiar with this uh, topic that we'd start with some basics just on, on the question of are we warming. So here's a schematic of uh, the energy of the sun uh, as it hits the earth and, and bounces back up into space and with greenhouse gases some of that energy is retained. It either warms the, the earth itself or it actually bounces back and gets hits on the greenhouse gases and comes back down again. And as a result, uh, we live in an environment where, where life can, can exist, actually. Um, uh, the problem is if that greenhouse gas layer gets uh, dense enough to where it retains too much heat, and then we start to change the ecosystem um, uh, because of the heat that we're retaining. Uh, all things that in this day and age a lot of people, uh, most people are aware of. Um, this is some data from NASA, uh, and I show it to you because uh, the, the black line here, which is the uh, trend in temperature on the surface of the Earth, um, is plotted in two different ways. One with a yellow line on it that shows all of the potential effects um, that could be causing uh, warming, so human and natural warming factors, and the blue line down below showing the, uh, just the natural factors. And what you can see is there's a 
very clear uh, differentiation since the 60s um, between the, uh, the observed line and the natural line. And that uh, observed line, that natural line uh, is, pops up to the, uh, to the data when we take into consideration the human effects. So there's our first indication that this is probably, uh, that the humans are probably affecting the temperature in some way. Another interesting piece of information that uh, not everyone's aware of is that uh, there's, a, there's an argument amongst the, uh, those who believe climate change is not human caused that it's being caused by the sun. Uh, but if it was co being caused by the sun increasing in heat, then you would expect it, uh, the atmosphere to be heating from the outside in as well as from the inside. Right? Um, the stratosphere, which is above the troposphere where we live here, is actually shrinking. It's cooling. At the same time, the troposphere is expanding because it's warming. That can't happen if the sun is causing the warming because this, if the sun was causing the warming, the stratosphere would also be heating up and expanding. And so there's another piece of evidence. Um, this is the Keeling curve, uh, named by, uh, for Dr. Keeling, who collected daily carbon dioxide measurements <clears throat> in, at Mauna Loa. This is probably the most famous piece of uh, monitoring data in the world right now. This is what started the whole <laughs> discussion on climate change. And um, it shows uh, the CO2 changes. These little swiggles are annual cycles. So each year you have periods of high carbon dioxide and low carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that, that represent the seasons. Um, but clearly uh, ramping up at a fairly steady clip. And one of the more important <coughs> reasons I show this slide is that uh, Keeling was defunded three times in the course of uh, getting, collecting this data before it finally became world news. And uh, this is a big problem with science. One of the things I uh, hope you'll come away from today is that there's a lot of issues in science that need to be addressed as well. It's not just, climate change is not just a policy problem. We also have to change the way we use our, our science. Um, and uh, long-term records are tough to maintain. People lose interest. Uh, funding ebbs and flows. And um, if he hadn't decided to just keep collecting those data anyway while he was doing his other work, we would never have had this record. Um, this, I, I show you this slide just to show you what the inside of our ice lab looks like out in Denver, Colorado. Uh, this is an ice core from a glacier. Uh, I don't know if it's the Greenland ice sheet or the Antarctic ice sheet, but um, uh, we collect whole cores several meters in length and bring them back because we can actually look at the gas bubbles that were frozen into the cores and using special technology can, can sip the gas out of those gas bubbles and measure it, which allows us to then go back in history because the, the ice at the bottom of that core was, collect, was uh, formed from the snow that fell thousands of years ago. In fact, we're, this figure we're looking at here shows 350, uh, 325,000 years of record. And we're 30% above the highest point ever recorded in the previous 325,000 years now. And all that change is occurring in the last few years. <clears throat> so again, evidence, data collected that uh, looks pretty strongly like we are having an influence. Finally, there's this uh, fingerprint um, effort. We, we call this fingerprinting by uh, ice, uh, using isotopes. Their atoms can, be, uh, can have several forms when they have more neutrons uh, one or more neutrons or one more fewer, fewer neutrons in their, uh, in their core. Um, and we can actually get, uh, depending on how that atom was formed, we can actually tell what the source was of that atom. It turns out that a heavier isotope, and I won't, I won't go into the details of what that actually means, um, is an indication of fossil fuel burning whereas a lighter isotope 
the outfit, as you can see here. And uh, this figure is simply uh, one from um, showing that uh, over time we seem to have increased the fossil fuel burned carbon in the atmosphere relative to the uh, natural carbon. So another indicator that we've done the change. Now I threw this uh, <clears throat> slide, actually I take it out, I put it back in. It shows um, a general model uh, from the Max Planck, the Max Planck Institute of, uh, of where they imagine the temperatures being in 2090 in terms of changes from, uh, from where we are now. And what you see is a fairly strong change of warming at the poles relative to the equator. Um, that's important for what we're experiencing right now. Because <clears throat> uh, you probably noticed that it's been a little chilly in Vermont lately. And, uh, you know, there are people who would say, well, then that's an indication that maybe global warming isn't so real. Uh, except that uh, it's part of this concept you've heard of the, the polar vortex, where we've got a circulation of air around the poles. It's a gyre that's fairly strong if there's a big difference between the temperature of the pole and the temperature of the equator. It's weak when there's a small difference. So as you decrease the difference between the pole and the equator, which is what that warming does that we're seeing there on that, then, then that spinning air starts to lose its form. It starts to break up a little bit and it wobbles and it forms pockets and lobes of air can go in, uh, off to one side. And that's exactly what we're experiencing right now. So even though we're freezing here, they had to move the Iditarod ski, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, race 250 miles north to Fairbanks from Anchorage because they didn't have Alaska to run the Iditarod this year because it's so warm. So uh, important take-home message from this, just because it's cold in one place doesn't mean it's cold everywhere. And it's the average temperature of the Earth that we're measuring here, and that we're not measuring the temperature at any one place. Now, climate effects are also showing that climate change is, is probably real. Here's the uh, observation of uh, sea level rise near Philadelphia. Um, significant changes over time. We're talking about eight inches since 1870. Um, interesting thing is that uh, sea level rise, you would think, would be fairly even around the world, uh, the bathtub effect. It actually isn't um, because of uh, currents, because of, um, <clears throat> because of some land subsiding along the coast and some land rising along the coast because of geologic reasons. There's a lot of things going on that make sea level rise different in different parts of the world. But in general, for the planet, the sea level is going up and it's because the oceans are warming and warm water takes up more space than cool water. It's because the ice on the land is melting into the ocean and it's actually not because of the ice that's floating on the ocean, of course, because that's like an ice cube in your glass of tea. Um, that doesn't actually change the uh, level of the water. <clears throat> Storms have uh, become more severe and there's some great research going on on this right now. John Woodruff from UMass, I put him in today showing him with a, a core that they collected. Uh, they were, they've been collecting deep sediment cores on Cape Cod. These cores allow them to look back in time and see uh, the history of sedimentation in, in ponds on the Cape. What they found is that a uh, period about 800 to 1700 years ago, that window, the ocean was warmer in the southern Atlantic and we had stronger storms. The same thing we're experiencing now. What's exciting about this is that this paper just came out <clears throat> a couple weeks ago and it's the first indication of historical record that shows that there's a pattern there that when you have a, a warm southern ocean you get stronger storms. <clears throat> um, so we're, this is not increasing the number of storms that occur. We, we are not seeing a trend in that. But we are seeing a trend in stronger storms. Ocean acidification. This occurs when extra carbon dioxide gets dissolved into the ocean water and it has an acidifying effect. And uh, this is fairly significant where it's, uh, you know, it's again variable around the oceans. 
uh, for a number of different reasons. But um, uh, what we're seeing is a tendency for um, for this to decrease uh, the um, sustainability of creatures in the ocean that uh, use uh, calcium carbonate. And so uh, coral reefs are, are, are bleaching. Uh, you can see up here the clam shells. Uh, this, this was done in an experiment in a lab, but it shows that you change the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the water and you get a fairly significant change in the growth of, of the clams. Um, this is a serious problem for living uh, things in the, in the ocean. Um, I threw in exotic pests uh, as a really important indicator, um, and it's an interesting one this year, in particular uh, with the hemlock woolly adelgid. <clears throat> um, we see movement of, uh, of um, invasive pests that, uh, that normally are in the uh, southern regions of the country are moving north. Um, but uh, this past two years, we've had uh, extreme cold in the northeast. And um, the reports coming back from the northern Appalachians, uh, Delaware Water Gap, areas like that, are showing a 90% dieback of hemlock woolly adelgia in the past two years in the winter, um, which is a fairly strong indication that they are temperature dependent. <clears throat> and um, of course, that 90% means that you know we, we obviously you'd want to get them to zero percent before you start warming up again. But it's an interesting story. Uh, phenology, really an interesting um, science. It's, it's how biology uh, times its natural events. So it's spring, you know, it's the, the date each year that the lilacs bloom, for example, or that birds uh, first show up uh, from the south. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, fellow, Robert Marsham, um, invented this science and started, uh, started Real, you know, people have been noticing the seasons for millennia, of course, but he started to write it down and um, turn it into science. <clears throat> and what I, I find interesting about this uh, uh, is that a number of people that, uh, that we know about from history were involved in, in actually measuring phenology. Thomas Jefferson, Henry David Thoreau, his, his data that he collected at Walden Pond is still being used today and is uh, one of the best phenological records for being able to see the changes that have occurred in budding in the, in the Northeast. <clears throat> so there he was again uh, giving us those observations. John Wesley Powell, the uh, first director of the U.S. Geological Survey, um, used phenology in a lot of the science he worked on. Nina Leopold <clears throat> Bradley, who is part of the Leopold family, uh, her father was uh, Aldo Leopold who wrote the Sand County Almanac, one of the first conservation uh, books for the public and in the United States, and um, great scientists working on, uh, working on phenology. And finally, uh, friend Jack, Jake Weltson, who is now leading the National Phenology Network, um, which is a, uh, a team of thousands of volunteers around the United States that are taking measurements of exactly when buds break, exactly when certain birds arrive in specific locations. Um, so this is, this is probably the most obvious uh, change that's occurring in the Northeast right now that you could measure yourselves, which is uh, it, the, the, um, the movement of the uh, first day of spring, essentially earlier in, in the Northeast. Uh, you know, the, the snow melt is happening earlier. The, uh, the flowers are blooming earlier. Very significant problem if you're a bird um, migrating north because you are used to migrating at a certain time because that's when your food sources are going to be available along the way. If you fly north and your food source has already bloomed and gone two or three weeks before you arrive, then you've got a problem. And we're starting to see this kind of thing on some of the flyways in the United States. So um, should we believe in climate change <clears throat> from all that evidence? I, I show you this Tolls cartoon here. It says, after comprehensive review of climate science, we've concluded that climate change is 99.5% certain, not 100% as we previously stated. And the what viewer is saying, aha, I knew it. Right? And, and we, of course, uh, get a lot of that. Um, but uh, when I talk to the public now about climate change, uh, I tell people that actually I don't believe in climate change. 
uh, when they ask me. And I don't believe in climate change because climate change is not a belief system. It is simply physics. And right now, the best physics that we can provide tells us that you might want to be careful, that there's some things going on here that are really a global experiment, much more of an experiment than any experiment with the economy that uh, people might uh, say we are, uh, we are recommending. Um, you've got 97 to 99% of the climate scientists that um, uh, are saying that uh, man is affecting the climate. Uh, and when you consider all the different people involved in climate effects and climate, the climate itself, that's at least a million people. Um, and so the argu and, and those people actually are part of the scientific enterprise. They are, um, they uh, live to prove that their colleagues are wrong. Uh, you know, that's, that's how we function. Uh, and it's what makes our science the best it can be. We have a very critical peer review. And um, so anyone who thinks that there's actually a conspiracy amongst this million people, you know, I, I just stop and think for a minute how you would manage such a conspiracy. You know, getting a million people to agree to the same thing um, and sticking to that story, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not really a problem. Um, so when Bill McKibben said um, in his talk that the science is clear, I think he's probably right. I can say that uh, the, data, the data right now is overwhelming, suggesting that, uh, that man is influencing the climate. Um, but, there's, uh, but there's some issues there that need to be addressed. One is, uh, why is the science still being questioned? Um, you know, if we were, had a miracle and we were able to get a major climate change policy enacted right now, uh, do we have the science in place to defend that policy the two or three years later that we'd have to defend it because someone would be saying, well, where's the change, right? Uh, if we keep warming, what will happen? Where will it happen and when? Uh, will changes be slow or sudden? Can we adapt? You know, what do we have to let go if, if we have to let some things go? We can't do everything, so how will we know what to do first? Um, and there's a series of you know, issues related to this, and particularly the one of why they're still questioning the science. The first is uncertainty. And um, we have a big problem in that scientists view uncertainty very differently from the way the public does. And we have a very strict uh, rule on uncertainty. It, we, we often use the 95% confidence interval. That means that if there is a 1 in 20 chance that our theory of what's happening is wrong, then we reject it and we start over. It's a 95% confidence interval, that's what that means. So that 1 in 20, so imagine if you went to Las Vegas and you had a 19 in 20 chance of winning and you decided to leave the table because you just didn't like those odds, right? That's essentially what scientists are doing because it's, it's a very conservative approach and it's uh, steeped in tradition that we could have a lengthy discussion about. But, um, you know, it, it begs the question of what's an appropriate burden of proof. And also, uh, back, to our, um, uh, back to our courtroom uh, analogy, you know, what uh, is the burden of proof on the victim or on the suspect in this case? You know, in a court of law, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. Um, who's the innocent party here? Uh, those of us who are polluting or the things that are being affected by the pollution? And, it, and it's an interesting philosophical question. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of some problems with models and uncertainty. This is the polar ice cap, and uh, um, I spent some time in the Arctic working on, uh, with uh, sci scientific colleagues on, um, on developing integrated programs around uh, Arctic uh, climate change issues. Um, we all know that the pole is melting, uh, the ice on the pole is melting, um, but when you look at the model, the, the models that we have on Arctic ice uh, melting, you find that um, in fact the data, which is in the red line here in that star in 2000, and, uh, that was in uh, 1997 I believe, um, <clears throat> uh, are not following the line of the model, which is in the blue there. Um, the model is actually much more conservative 
than uh, the data are showing. And, and there's some question as to whether or not part of the reason it's more conservative is that, is that um, the scientists are so concerned about not being biased that they actually overcompensate in the other direction sometimes uh, with the way we model these things. And so um, coming up with accurate models for something like this it involves a tremendous amount of data collection that we don't always have the funding to, uh, to, uh, to do. I would call this the second most famous monitoring justification, the first one being the Keeling curve. Uh, we need to keep uh, data collection going and we need to expand it. Um, has the warming stopped? This is an important question uh, from the uh, climate skeptics perspective because there's, uh, there's a perspective out there that since 1998 that basically the, uh, the climate models have been wrong. <clears throat> uh, you can see this is the temperature curve here and there's this what they call the hiatus period where it's flat. It's the highest temperatures on record but it's flat. Um, and the CO2 curve keeps climbing, so it suggests a disconnect between CO2 and the warming. Um, but when you look at how we've been collecting our data, we have a lot of data that's on the surface of the Earth. Uh, we collect data on terrestrially, uh, from sea temperature buoys. The merchant marine data is fascinating data. That they've been collecting temperature data on merchant marine ships for years and years, every time they cross the Atlantic and Pacific. And um, <clears throat> when we, they first started going after this data several years ago, a lot of it was like in garages, in boxes, paper notes, and uh, just millions of pieces of paper. Um, they actually developed a, a program where people, uh, um, retirees, anybody who's interested can adopt a ship online. And you, and you get, uh, they, um, they scanned all these pieces of paper and you get a stack of paper for a given ship on your computer and you go into it and you type in the temperature data. And then uh, they have maybe two or three other people with that same ship temp type in the temperature data and that's their quality control. So they can see whether you typed it in or not. And that's how they're getting all of this data. Uh, you know, we used to have monks in monasteries do this kind of thing. And, <laughs> and uh, now we have volunteers online. It's pretty cool. Um, so what's going on here? We got all this radiation going on, and, you know, and yet uh, we got this hiatus period. But there's all this blue out here, and that's uh, what they started to focus in on. And they found that um, the uh, periods of El Nino, which are, there's 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 circulation periods within the ocean where the where the water circulates differently, and sometimes it's rising from the bottom along Peru, and sometimes it's falling along and uh, the El Nino that you've heard about in the news is a period of time where heat is actually released from the ocean into the atmosphere. Uh, 1998 was a particularly huge event where a lot of energy from the ocean was, uh, was put into the atmosphere. <clears throat> but then the El Nino stopped. <coughs> and um, the, uh, the warm surface water started plunging down into the, into the deeper ocean and circulating around that way. We also had a, a period of time where um, there was a lot of evaporation because of the warming in the North Atlantic and that was causing the, uh, it to become, the water to become saltier, which is denser, and then it would start to drop fairly soon, uh, early, and, and when it gets circulated back down, take all the heat with it while it's dropping. So we've got the deep ocean. So um, as a possible place where this heat is going. So they developed these things called Argo floats. There's now 3,476 of them around the ocean. This is the Global Climate Observing System uh, network. And these things actually drop down 2,000 meters and then come back up taking temperature measurements. And when each time they pop up, they beam to a satellite and, and send the data. It's, it's a crazy invention and it's, uh, it's another example of, of clever monitoring and what they found is that 93% of the heat is going into the oceans. And, um, and the majority of that heat right now is going into the deep ocean. I gave you some examples of uh, uh, like the equivalent of four Hiroshima bombs per second of heat has been going into the oceans. Um, and this is since 1998. Uh, 983 billion Hurricane Sandys. That's a lot of energy. 
Um, so the point is the models aren't enough. We need the data. What see you know since we were uh, only measuring the surface of the planet, it seemed like the models were off. The models actually aren't off. And when we go back into an El Nino cycle, we will probably see ourselves popping back up to the line. So um, complication number two: there's too many things going on with the, um, with the uh, with the environment. We've got uh, not just climate change, but we've got water pollution, we've got development, we've got logging, we've got burning of uh, the Amazon rainforest. All of that's happening. And <clears throat> in, under, in order to understand climate effects, we actually have to understand it in the context of all those other changes that are occurring on the landscape. That's how complicated it really is, because climate is just an added stress to these other stressors that are going on. And it's the cumulative stress that ultimately matters on how the how the environment responds. So I'll give you a quick example on um, acid precipitation. In this case, we're talking about nitric acid and sulfuric acid. <clears throat> this is how I spent most of my career was studying this. Um, and uh, you know, we've got deposition coming from the atmosphere. And in particular, we, we focused in on the nitric acid in the Catskills because we had a problem with uh, nitrate in the streams. Um, so we set up uh, using a watershed approach. This is um, uh, a watershed in, in the cent center of the, uh, of the Catskill Mountains. And we, um, we d measured the inputs in our rain collectors, and we measured the outputs uh, both uh, coming off of the soil and, and going down through the, str uh, the stream. And we used the water as the blood of the system to try to get an indication of the changes that were occurring and the balances that were occurring between what we were taking in for energy and what we were putting out. Um, what we found, this is a picture of Biscuit Brook during the peak of snow melt, is that during storm events we got big pH drops in the stream that actually it wasn't sulfuric acid that was doing it for the most part, it was mostly nitric acid that was rising. <clears throat> and uh, that's from, it's from, fossil, uh, from coal power, fire power plants, but it's also from cars. So there seemed to be an excess of nitrate in the system. And in fact, uh, uh, from 2000, 2006, you can see there, the, the nitrate was rising in the stream in general, not just during the storm events, because this is nitrate concentration and this is time across the bottom. Um, so EPA asked me, well, uh, I tell you what, it, tell us, uh, give us a correlation between the deposition of nitrogen coming in from all this pollution and the stream nitrogen that you're observing, and that's what that top figure is, and there's no relationship there. If anything, uh, as deposition increases, we actually have more rain associated with the greater amount of load of nitrogen that's coming in. We actually got a dilution, if anything. And I, <clears throat> this was a real conundrum, and we spent a week looking at all sorts of different things, correlating one chemical versus another and whatnot. And the last thing I did was I just, in frustration, I took my air temperature data and I threw it on, threw it on the computer and measured stream nitrate concentration versus air temperature and got this crazy tight relationship. So the warmer the year, the more nitrate we were putting out of the stream. Well, this didn't sound like climate science, uh, like uh, acid rain. So we started working and we measured uh, nitrogen in the soil, we measured it in the trees. We actually uh, you have a system where you, uh, you shoot leaves down from trees and you, then you can uh, measure them chemically in the, uh, in the lab. So, um, this is my slide to show you that, you know, we're really not nerds. This is actually really fun. <laughs> you know, and science can be cool. <laughs> um, and what we found, actually, is that uh, the soil microbes were controlling how much nitrate was getting out into the streams. Normally, forest growth uh, determines how much nitrogen is released from a watershed. They, the trees take up all the nitrogen because they need it as a nutrient. And there's usually very little that's getting out into the streams. Well, we have all this nitrogen gushing into the streams. It turns out, if the trees are getting all they need because there's so much coming in, the microbes are the next gatekeeper. They decide, they're, they're munching on whatever nitrogen they can get that the trees aren't taking. And if there's a lot of nitrogen around, they eat more when they're warm. And uh, they process the nitrogen and put it into a form that actually then is flushed out of the soils. So it turns out there actually is a correlation and that uh, in a place like the Catskills where we've got a serious acid rain problem, it's exacerbated by climate change.
because, okay. So this is just a little example to show you that um, it's not until you look at the whole system all together that you really start to understand what's controlling the conditions for any one particular element that you might be interested in, like nitrate. Right? And we use this, actually, to then um, recommend that uh, they add soil chemistry to their decisions on what, how to cut the forest. Up to that point, a silviculture was all done by assessing the, the condition of the tree above ground. And we said in places like the Catskills, you actually have to know what the soil chemistry is doing because if you have a seriously depleted nitrogen saturated soil, <clears throat> then you will um, potentially cut the trees down and have nothing grow back and just have a fern glade or an invasive species. And so that's part, part of the uh, management prescription now for the, for the Catskills. So it's back to this point that I was making before is that uh, climate's a superimposed stress on the other stressors. And that it's the combination of all these stressors that eventually affects how a system responds, whether or not an ecosystem degrades. <clears throat> and so that leads us to um, this final point I want to make, which is about tipping points. This is the north slope of Alaska in 2007. Um, first time ever recorded a fire on the tundra of the north slope. This was massive. This, this is an aerial photograph. And it was a huge fire. Um, it didn't, as far as people knew, it had never burned before. Um, and uh, so the environment here obviously hits some threshold of tolerance that would allow a fire to rage through what is normally a wet environment. And it's, it's this idea of tipping points where you, you've got in a, the ball and cup theory where, you know, the ball basically stays in its cup until you roll it just far enough that it can roll down into a new state, right? And then you've got a problem where if you really want it to be in that condition, you have to figure out how to get it back. <clears throat> um, we saw this happen in the East Coast with uh, hurricanes. You know, the, the bay condition of Chesapeake Bay, pre-Hurricane Agnes, and then a new stable state that have occurred because of all the erosion and the changing of, of flow paths and, and the uh, chemical things that occurred. Um, and, you know, you could actually do a restoration of that landscape, but you've got to do something that allows it to not only kick into that next, uh, that better condition that you're after, but you've got to be able to get it to a point where it's not going to just roll back again. Um, so a big problem when you're doing something like I'm doing now, which is uh, advising on how to um, <clears throat> make the coast more resilient for hurricanes like Hurricane Sandy, um, because you have to figure out where those tipping points are and what the tolerances are. So here's, here's an example of the Yukon River Basin. Um, we've got, uh, <clears throat> um, this is a, a map of, of the world, but it shows the, uh, this dark red here shows how much carbon is actually up in the north. It's in frozen soils. Massive amounts of carbon. And that's, that soil is now starting to thaw. Okay? And it hasn't thawed for a long time. So we're now starting to release carbon into the atmosphere. And so we've got environments like this in the uh, Yukon Basin where we were doing the studies that you got what, what they call drunken trees, where the trees are all starting to lean over. It's because the landscape there is collapsing. You can see it's saturated because the permafrost is still solid. The surface is melting. But eventually, you get to a point where, where it collapses. And then the organics all fall in. And uh, it goes anoxic. And there's a big methane burst. And so a lot of the carbon ends up getting released um, through these uh, bursts of methane. That's the first step that occurs. But then uh, the landscape actually dries. Uh, because the permafrost will thaw down to the point where the water can release down through. And when that occurs, uh, then it dries out and uh, black spruce is oily and you are then susceptible to fire. So you can see the map of the Yukon River Basin up there. Um, this is the entire Yukon River Basin covered in smoke. All those little red dots are fires. This was 2005. 
and it was an unbelievable fire event. And, every, and many of the years since then, we've had significant forest fires in this area, and it's because of the drying of the, of the environment and the permafrost changes that are occurring. So there's a, I'd say that's a fairly obvious tipping point that was reached. Um, that uh, changes the state of the ecosystem there fairly substantially. Um, now Thoreau was, uh, was on to this whole issue of whole system science um, back in the early 1800s. So I fear that the character of my knowledge is from year to year becoming more distinct and scientific. That in exchange for views as wide as heaven's cope, I am narrowing down to the field of a microscope. I see details not holes or the shadows of the hole. I count some parts and I say I know. This is what inspired me to say that we're really now trying to reinvent these ideas that he was grappling with at that point um, for the first time really in, in America and uh, in some cases in Europe. Um, here's a, another fellow who came after him, John Muir, I'm actually, my colleague in the Northeast region, the other science advisor for uh, Northeast region is named Rachel Muir. She's John Muir's uh, granddaughter. And um, <clears throat> he had this one quote. He said, uh, he's, he was a great explorer. He's a guy who talked um, Teddy Roosevelt into starting the national parks in, in much of the West and said, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. I thought that was a very succinct way of saying this. So. You know, the climate effects science dilemma we've got is that we've got valuable historical records, but they're scattered and the systems level observations are poor. Uh, most science funding and thinking is actually short term. It's two to four year projects. They're all discrete projects. They're usually competed. And so there isn't as much collaboration as you might want going on. Um, without whole system data sets, adaptation will be incomplete. The public is actually so disconnected with the environment at this point that we don't really know uh, what to believe. And um, without the kind of measurements in place that we need, these long-term measurements, uh, policies are going to be hard to sustain or maintain if we are able to do them. Um, we do have some things happening. Here's the National Phenology Network. As I said, you know, um, 3,112 observers at this point and still growing. Uh, it's an exciting thing. I can tell you about it if you're interested because it's something that you can participate in. Um, I just helped work on what we call a surge wave and tide hydrodynamics network for the eastern coast in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, uh, where we're going to be measuring um, the actual surge of, uh, of, you know, of, the, of the storm event and the waves on top of that as they come in uh, to be able to figure out where our most vulnerable spots are on the coast. We're doing a lot of work on wetlands not only figuring out how to maybe add sediment to wetlands in order to maintain them as sea level rises, but also looking uphill and saying, can these wetlands actually migrate inland? Or do we have to remove some buildings in order to make space for them? Because uh, those wetlands are key to the flyway for a number of uh, birds. And they're also very important for uh, protecting the coast. Um, so we've got all these different programs out there. Uh, that are collecting data. Some of them have act some of the programs on this figure that I used 15 years ago now actually have expired because uh, as independent programs they were tough to defend. They could only be really well defended as a group. But we've got imagine yourself with these pile of programs and we can link some of them, maybe not all of them, but uh, but there's obviously connections between the data they're collecting, and you translate that into interpretations and you start to add in more programs and you eventually start to build what I call the puzzle. And that's, that's the concept that we're talking about. And what we need more than anything right now are these big thinkers. You know, you're, you, I, am, I am nearing the end of my career. We need people from the next generation that will do this and be what I call the puzzle makers. Taking all these disparate pieces and finally pulling them together like Thoreau was saying, he was frustrated, was, uh, was starting to pull apart in his own life. So, um, the challenges uh, with science will still continue. This is one of my favorite cartoons that shows a guy saying all the great things that are going to happen if we uh, deal with climate change, and the guy in the background saying, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> right. So, um, 
we just have to deal with that. Uh, the science needs to be true to the science, and um, and uh, this debate will continue. Um, but uh, I think really the key here to all of this is that um, science literacy in the in the entire population, not just the people that want to go into STEM, you know, courses, not just the people that want to become forensic scientists like uh, like I've been describing um, for the climate. But all of us need to have enough understanding of what's going on, of, of, of climate science, to be able to not be buffaloed by a lot of the noise that's happening out there in, in, the, uh, in the discourse. So it, this is from Baba Doom, a uh, Senegali environmentalist. And I have this on my wall because I always want to be reminded of the importance of it. In the end, we will protect only what we love, love only what we understand, and understand only what we are taught. So I ask you to learn well, and please join the forensic team, because we need you. And that's what I have. <laughs> so um, I know we started a little late, and I'm ending almost at 8. So uh, those of you who need to leave, please, uh, you're welcome to do so. But I'll stick around for questions for anybody who has them. that the water isn't rising at the same rate everywhere? For sea level rise. Yeah, yeah, the sea level yeah. rise. And do you think that's affecting, I mean, the fact that it's not rising at the same time, do you think that's affecting the temperature changes as well? Because I know that the temperature of the sea is going up as well. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's affecting the, the temperature of the ocean. I mean, I mean the, the ocean temperature is actually part of what's causing the sea level rise. <coughs> Right, so it's kind of it's a it's a flip of that because warmer water takes up more space, and so it's expanding. And that's one of the big reasons for it. The other big reason is that we've got uh, ice melting off of land, so water's coming, you know, extra water's coming in. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, yeah. The interesting thing on the on these this variability is we've got some places. You know, one of the, one of the things we're working on right now is part of the with the money we got for Hurricane Sandy is. Um, is asking the question of where we are most vulnerable along the coast. Uh, the Hampton Roads area in southern Virginia, uh, or Norfolk, that area. It's, uh, the landscape happens to be subsiding right now for reasons that are geologic. At the same time, the sea level rise is coming up. So they've got a particular problem there. Um, there's other parts of the Northeast where you've still actually got some rebound from the last glaciation, because when you had a mile of ice on the earth, on the surface of the earth, it actually pressed the ground down a bit. And some of that is still coming back. And so that would be moving away as sea level rise, and so that, that works with us. So it, it depends, you know, where you look around the, uh, the northeast generally is it, uh, the, nor the northeast part of the Atlantic. Uh, where we are is actually an area of fairly high sea level rise relative to other parts of the world. And it's, yeah, it's fascinating. It's, it's a subtle thing. Yeah? Do you think climate change can ever be stopped, or is this just the way it's going to be? Um, I don't know. Big question. Uh, is, will the climate change stop, or is it the way it's going to be? Um, there's, uh, you know, we haven't made the moves yet globally to do what we need to do. There's another big meeting coming up in Paris, and uh, uh, you read the same newspapers I do. So you know, I, I'm not sure how whether they'll be able to make some progress there or not. Um, there are a lot of things happening technologically that are exciting, uh, uh, and particularly a lot of things happening at the local level that might you know uh, grow in time across the globe. But um, right now, it's, we already know that there's a lot of climate change that's going to occur anyway, no matter what we do, because it is about a 100-year lag effect. And so the government in the United States is spending a lot of time thinking about adaptation as much as they are about actually mitigating. Yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking in terms of um, when I deal with people outside the academic community. Okay. And, for example, the common wisdom is that the acid rain is coming from 
the um, pollution that's coming from various plants mm -hmm. and things. And you can usually see those, so it's all yes, easy. Yes, you, you can right. see them. But then you're also talking about how what's really causing <coughs> the problems in the streams are the nitrogens mm -hmm. that would normally be used by the trees that right. are then um, well, just that there's a, there's a complex set of relationships that right. we so have to understand in order to really, yeah. My point is, is if people are having trouble even grasping kind of obvious correlations, right. what can we do to help them even be interested in looking at yeah. the more interrelated <laughs> concepts? Because a lot of people are just going to shut down and say, well, it isn't as easy as you said it was, and if you've got to go to all of these stratagems to explain how it's working, then right. you must not know what's going on either. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't dig into that with kind of thing usually with the broad public, but the, um, um, you know, and there's a lot of people that are writing about the subject that are thinking about it harder than I am, actually, you know, about how you engage the public on these issues, you know, um, <coughs> taking an ethical approach is, you know, it's usually recommended for some, you know, I, um, in those articles that I've read. But uh, I think, you know, there are ways to simplify the discussion, you know, and, and give them analogies that work in their lives, lives you know. I, mean, I, I give a story when, uh, when I'm dealing with, you know, a skeptical audience, um, <clears throat> which I haven't done much of yet, but, you know, I, uh, where, I've, where I've run into it, I, I talk about um, this whole uncertainty thing, because that's a big thing that really bothers them, that you know, the scientists aren't 100% sure. And uh, it's beyond reasonable doubt in a court of law, but you know, it's scientific uncertainty, obviously, as I described. But I, I tell people, um, imagine that they're driving down a road in New England in the fall at night, and it's right near freezing, and the man on the radio, the weatherman, uh, tells us that uh, there's a 50% chance of black ice on the road ahead. They don't say 100% because they don't know for sure. There's a 50% chance, right? And you're speeding along to get somewhere in a hurry, and there's a curve about a mile up and a 100 foot drop on the other side of the road, right? And so, you know, what's a percentage that's acceptable to you where you will, you know, does it have to be 90% for you to slow down? Right. Does it have to be 80%? Right? And uh, what I've been doing lately is going on beyond that and saying, um, and uh, my question back to them, because I don't tell them what the answer ought to be, um, is uh, what's the conservative thing to do? Is it to speed to that date you're trying to get to? Or is it to slow down for the curve? You know, until you know better. Until you know whether we can get through the black ice. You know, and uh, so I can't tell you all the answers to the nitrate, you know, yeah. all the, you know, but I can tell you that, you know, you ought to think about what the conservative thing to do is. You know, and right now, it's to be cautious. <clears throat> yeah? You mentioned that local things are happening, and what can we, as individuals, do to help the whole mother planet? Well, um, Bill would tell you to get involved in 350.org, of course, um, you know, which is a, which is a great thing. Um, and, uh, uh, my daughter's friends would love to see you, <laughs> see you join. Um, the uh, there are there are things like uh, you know in, in my world, there's more and more citizen science going on that's becoming extremely valuable uh, because we can get so many more points than we can if we drive our federal vehicles out there and take the measurements. And so things like this National Phenology Network, where you could be um, measuring the bud burst on your own lilacs in your own yard and putting that in a database with 3,000 other points, um, that becomes pretty powerful. So there's a lot of those kinds of things that are starting to occur now. And I can show you some of them, and, and, and I'm sure you can find others. Yeah. Well, for me, heating with wood, having an efficient home, right, right, driving a car that gets, it's a 99 car, but it gets 35 miles to the gallon. Uh, there well, has I, to be I concur with you completely. You, you know, you got you got to walk the talk too, and uh, and and that's a that's a great thing. 
we all we all try. You know, it's uh, living in this society. Most people find it challenging to walk the talk as much as they like. They need to drive to work. And they need to do certain things. And you know, it, we live in a society that requires that. Um, finding ways around those things, of course, is uh, an endless personal challenge. <laughs> yeah. On a larger scale, <coughs> what from your side? Observations. What would you recommend that, say, our government put in place in an ideal world, or that all nations? Right. Um, so, I, as I said at the beginning, we don't really, uh, you know, engage in the policy side besides informing the policy discussions. I'm involved with the Department of the Interior now in a lot of work related to Hurricane Sandy and the coastal environment. And, um, and they're, uh, they're managing um, to uh, move a little ever so slowly towards adaptation recommendations, <clears throat> which um, some of which are things that people will readily do and uh, some of things that are um, abhorrent to people, so they're even creating softer terms for them. For example, um, there's a new term going around called managed retreat. Well, that means uh, you're going to lose your home. <laughs> right? Yeah, that, that we need to move you out of that area because that's going to be flooded or that's going to, you know, that'll become an environmental hazard at some point. Um, uh, you know, but we have. Uh, you think about the power plants and the and the uh, wastewater treatment plants, etc. That we have in the floodplain. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of work to do there. And so, managed retreat is a serious business that people are talking about. There's actually uh, Staten Island is actually doing it. They're actually uh, evacuating certain parts of Staten Island right now, buying the houses and taking them out because they think <coughs> that area is going to be underwater and um, that we have to give that land up. So uh, a lot of tough choices that people are going to have to be making. And being part of that discussion, I think, is what's really important uh, because uh, you want reasoned people making those decisions and not people that have you know, some vested interest. <coughs> a question. Yeah. Um, can we still fight against global warming? Can we still fight against global warming? Well, sure. I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know if I would call what I'm doing fighting against global warming. I'm, I'm informing the global warming debate, and I feel like that's important. So that, that's something you could decide to join in and do. Um, but there's the advocacy side also that, uh, that Bill spoke to you about. And, um, and he's far more of an expert on that kind of thing than I am. But uh, I think he gave you guys a lot of ideas on, on ways in which you could engage in, in that side of the equation. And um, I highly encourage you to do so. There, there's, there's some interesting books out there. that I, I didn't talk about the non-scientific reasons that people uh, are still saying that climate change is not real. <clears throat> you know, the, there's, some, uh, there's some excellent books you can read that, that offer suggestions on things to, you know, can do. What, one, one of the more important, I think, is Naomi Klein's book, uh, This Changes Everything. It just came out this past year. Um, Bill Moyers called it one of the top 20 books of the year. Um, and uh, it's a pretty fascinating read. And offers um, a critique of how we handle big issues like this in our um, with our economic system, but it also offers some suggestions on things people can do. Yeah? With the scientific community um, being so focused on a very small aspect of something, how would you recommend changing essentially the culture to focus something more broadly? That's a really interesting question. And it's, it's very tough because, you know, um, it's as challenging as changing the culture of policy making, I think, uh, because um, we have a system that, you know, and, and, and frankly, there are good reasons for that system of competition for scientific dollars. You know, it brings out the best proposals. Um, 
it, uh, it forces people to really dig you know, for the best ideas. Um, but it also, uh, and so you know, for cutting edge science, it's a model that works in many ways. Um, it's just when you have these big science problems that we've got now, you know, um, the Manhattan Project, when they were developing the atomic bomb, they, they didn't just farm that out to a bunch of two and four year research projects. There was a coordinated effort. When we put an ant on the moon, there was a coordinated effort. And so um, there, there needs to be a mechanism built that allows scientists uh, who are in need of resources to do their work to find a way to uh, find collaboration, a stronger incentive than <clears throat> uh, working along. And, um, and we need to fund uh, directly people that are working on integration. And, and in fact, you know, uh, it's not all that bleak. There, you know, people are doing that now. Uh, I'm, I'm working, I'm on a committee now that's developing a set of measurements for having uh, our, our, our job is to figure out a set of core measurements that everybody will take measure for the projects that the Department is, of Interior is funding on coastal resilience, on improving the coastline. Right? So all of the projects have to take these certain core measurements so that when they're done, we have a set of core measurements that we can compare against. Uh, so there's that kind of thing that's starting to happen. It's just, it's, it's, it's different from our core culture of how we do things in this country, and so it's taking some time to get it to, to work. And um, so when I talk about it, I, I talk about this as being a need that we can't uh, undervalue. We have, to, we have to really push on it. Yeah? Just following up on that thought, um, there was a quote, uh, I don't know if it was Muir or, or, or Thoreau, about everything being connected to everything else. Right. Do you have hope that um, that focusing on the coast, uh, because of Hurricane Sandy, the information that's gleaned or, or results from that will actually, because everything is connected, then inform lots of other areas, not just coastline when it comes to things like this? Or do you think that's just, a again, another just one shot kind of looking at the coastline? Um, I, you know, I don't know. To be honest, um, I've been through a few of these. And uh, um, there's, you know, priorities that, that get discussed and, and, you know, these priorities don't always rise to the fore. Uh, so, um, you know, the work I just described to you in Alaska, you know, was terminated a few years ago. Um, what, right as we were starting to make some progress on the integrated piece. Now, we ended up still providing some pretty good ideas on the whole idea of integrated science, but, but it, um, and I'm not knocking where the money went, you know, because there were other big issues that needed to be addressed. The problem is, you know, is keeping money consistent and this kind of thing. So, so you need some sort of an integration concept that everybody decides they need to buy into for a while. Uh, there's, you know, NSF is developing uh, something called NEON, you know, to, which is the, uh, it, it's an ecosystem observing network, it's National Ecosystem Observing Network. And it's a series of stations, 19 stations around the country, where they're instrumenting the heck out of them. And uh, then they have some, uh, they even have planes for doing surveillance mapping around these sites in between them. And it, the whole idea is to establish 30 years of record in a few key locations and then asking academics to all come and do their work there so that they start to pull together. Um, it takes more than just inviting them, uh, you know, because uh, I, we've had a lot of projects where we said they were going to be truly interdisciplinary and they ended up being multidisciplinary and there's a difference. Multidisciplinary is people working side by side but not collaborating. You know, interdisciplinary is when they actually have to figure out what their data means to the other guy. And um, so taking that extra leap is sometimes difficult. I, I think uh, that what we're trying to do with Sandy right now, to be honest, is we're trying to be that example. We've got some funding because of what happened. It's this window of opportunity. Let's show how to do it right and provide an example out there. Um, will they then, you know, will the public then say, great, let's do it in the next place? You know, 
your guess is as good as mine on that one. My guess is right now it's going to be a fairly tight few years. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll have the example there. And, and uh, we'll be ready. Yeah, okay. So, um, I'm, I'm hearing that it might be time to wrap it up, but uh, I'll still be able to chat with you guys individually as you want to. And thank you. It's been an enjoyable evening.